All right, thanks everybody. Uh, great to see so much uh, interest in, in the subject of, of water. Uh, certainly a place where I've spent a lot of my time. My name's Matthew Pryor, uh, and I'm the co-founder of uh, an ag tech venture capital firm called Tenacious Ventures, uh, but previously spent a lot of time in the IoT water management space, which is, uh, yeah, has a, a lot to do with my kind of view on the importance of water. And I'd like to throw to Kristen to introduce herself. Thank you, Matthew. My name's Kristen Roy. I'm the director of Zero Mass Water Australia. We're a US company based around the world now. We have a renewable water technology called the Source Hydro Panel, which uses sunlight and air to create drinking water. Thanks. Uh, my name's Dan Crozier. I'm the managing director of SKG. Uh, we m manage hygiene and cleaning and production for food and beverage manufacturers around Australia. So everything from uh, Coca-Cola in Queensland to abattoirs and fish and all that sort of thing. So as you can imagine, a lot of water goes into those processes. So we're continually looking to drive down the input costs, both uh, for water and water associated things like heating, pumping, disposal and chemicals. So very keen on reducing the amount of water that's consumed in the food industry around Australia. Um, <clears throat> my name is Said Miri, I'm from Airbus, from the intelligence part of Airbus, and we provide satellite data solutions and uh, for agriculture, forestry, and different market depending uh, how these technology can be used. And we, we're very much looking into how the space technology and the new upcoming technology can be adopted and customized uh, for uh, agriculture and forestry area. That's the area that I'm more interested in at the moment. Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Furphy. Um, <laughs> I'm not Tom, not Tom Rooney. Rooney. Um, I'm CEO of uh, Wedgetail Food and Fibre, and we're part of a asset agricultural asset management group uh, that runs around 10,000 hectares of intensive irrigation uh, cropping country across um, northern Victoria. Uh, so we're managing assets probably, and water, uh, land and environmental assets probably in the range of approaching half a billion. Cool, thanks. And, and I would like to especially acknowledge uh, Richard because Tom uh, is in Adelaide Airport, uh, fogged in and was unable to make it. And uh, I called Richard less than two hours ago and uh, threw him a big hospital pass, so I really appreciate uh, stepping up. And I, I realise I've also failed completely at my job. Uh, apparently, we're meant to hold the mic like that and shine it like a torchlight, not like that. So, cool. Um, obviously, water, you know, there's so many different directions to come at this from, and I remember in, in some of the prep I was doing and reading, one of the things that, that uh, struck out to me was, you know, in terms of our human uh, experience, you know, we can live for many months without shelter, we can live for many weeks without food, but we can barely go days without water. So it's, it's, it's so fundamental to who we are as humans. And Chris and I was struck by um, some of the, the stories you were telling me in terms of your journey into, into water and, and, and where you are. Maybe if you could relate a, a little bit of that background that brought you into this focus around uh, water. Sure. Am I? I, I believe that's right. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. So I started my career studying human rights law, which led me to move into working in litigation. I was based in West Africa for over a decade, representing fishing and farming communities against extractive sector companies. So I saw pretty up close and personal some of the very devastating consequences, both human and environmental, of our reliance on the extractive sector, which led me to move home a couple of years ago and start working in solar development because I thought, you know, renewable energy was the obvious answer to instead of waiting around for these disasters to happen, I wanted to be part of something more proactive and uh, part of a solution. But working in solar development, I found myself travelling around to rural and remote parts of Australia and was quite struck by the revelation that actually in a lot of these communities, people didn't have access to clean and consistent drinking water. This is in, in Australia in 2017. So 
from there it was quite a natural journey to join Zero Mass Water, who at the time had just started working in Australia. And this is a company that for me was interesting because they were using renewable energy to create water for, for humans to address this critical and tangible and, and urgent need. So for me it was a perfect crossover of you know, renewables meets human rights. Yeah, fantastic. And, and I mean, I think, you know, our, our experience, uh, Australia is so much tied up, tied up with water and, and how it uh, intersects with all the things we do. I think one of the things that is less well understood, Richard, is how we think about water and its role in, in food production. I mean, most people's experience most of the time is it starts at the supermarket. Um, and we, maybe we hear stories or watch Four Corners and things and sort of hear these terrible stories about what water is and isn't doing in agriculture, but um, interested in, you know, your perspective, how do you think about water, how does it factor in the economics, you know, obviously Australia leads the world in a lot of respects in terms of water being an asset that has economic value to it and can be traded around. Uh, when we started uh, our project uh, 12 years ago, we started buying up land in northern uh, Victoria, uh, near, between Kerrang and uh, Lake Boga and Swan Hill. At the time, uh, we paid probably about 1.5 times the value uh, of the land for the water to irrigate that country. Today, that would be about four, approaching five times the value of the land. So um, it's incredibly important, uh, the most important input into what we produce. And in fact, right now, I'm working with uh, all the guys that we sell to, um, and we produce crops. We don't, we're not a, a livestock producer. We, we grow uh, a large amount of organic cereals, um, legumes, and um, tomatoes process for processing. And um, we're working with our customers to where we can have them accept a, a water adjuster in the contract so that the, the, the price that they pay uh, will, will effectively float with the value of, of water such as the, as the importance of it. So it's, um, and that, that, that they, they deal with the supermarkets uh, who in turn, you know, uh, need to come to grips with that as well. And it's, it's as, as everyone would appreciate, it's an incredibly complex and um, what's well, sensitive issue as well. Uh, that is, uh, it's a very, it's a very hard, hard thing to explain, even to someone who's yeah. you know deeply engaged on a contractual basis. But then to have a supermarket understand their prices are going up because the price of water is um, is a challenge. Can you can you talk a little bit more uh, on that subject of? So we talk about you know the water's got an economic value, and and uh, it's great to hear that you can help manage the variability in that. But one of the things, that at least the theories behind. Um, having water move to productive use is because it will also generate other economic activity in those regional areas. Can you relate sort of stories about, you know, what the production that you do and the kind of ecosystem that sits around that? Sure. The, the, our, our project started with a, a $200 million commitment by Vic Super, uh, who uh, we worked with around the idea, the, th the investment thesis of something that, as well as providing a return to the investors, would have some environmental and social upside. And so we sort of scanned, uh, it had to be in Victoria, so we scanned sort of Victoria for regions where that could be achieved and we settled on this, um, this, this 50 kilometre stretch between, um, uh, towards like Swan Hill, which is, was an irrigation uh, region slated for closure uh, because it was uh, the farms there were no longer economic. Uh, the soil had been terribly degraded through the poor irrigation um, and um, the way irrigation went, was done where it was effectively was just open a chute and let it run to the lowest part of the, the country. So there was a lot of salinity, a lot of really degraded country and farmers weren't making money. So we aggregated some 40 farms uh, 10,000 hectares and um, in that time probably invested about $40 million into efficient irrigation infrastructure. Effectively where... Presumably we're probably installed by local contractors. Local, and local contractors. Um, all local, where, wherever we can, they're all, all local. Um, so 
we, we estimate some $30 million has flowed through that community. Fantastic. And, um, and we're growing you know, crops there that which had never been grown before. So I think we're now the largest grower of processing tomatoes in the country and achieving yields as high as anywhere in the world on country that had, no one would ever have dreamed that would even be possible. Through. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. And, and I know you, know you touched on the point there that, it, I mean, it, these are difficult subjects because, I mean, there's a lot of complexity there and, and, and also um, the messages tend to get simplified. One of the messages that we do see a bit in the in media is where people aren't being responsible with their use of water and um, how well measurement is, is currently happening. And so Ed, I'm wondering, um, you know, from the perspective of remotely sensed information, you know, you know, historically it's been the death ridge wheel and water meters and this kind of stuff, but where do you think we're heading in terms of the ability to look at large scale with accuracy and work out what are people doing with the water? Are they really growing a crop that makes sense with the water that's being used and that kind of stuff? Uh, well, that's interesting because uh, I've been involved in the mapping industry for many years and managing and dealing with climate change type of data and always dealing with high volume, remotely sensed data, space data was, was an issue because you had to get the data, have it in-house, processing it, and storage, ability to compute it was, was one of the key ones. But these days, while having cloud computing and having a large volume data available from current satellites, yeah. there are a large number of satellites that have been launching every, every year, every, you know, it, it could be a small satellite or robust satellite and so on. Now, the key is ability to process the data on demand and make it available as quickly as possible. These days, from measurement, looking into water, for example, and how yeah. crops performing, you, uh, these days, um, there are, for example, our company, we yeah. design an online system that you can look into any particular farm, yeah. and you put a polygon around your farm, and it goes through the history, looking at all the available images, run the algorithms and provide the data to you as information. You don't have to deal with any of the data. J just to give people a sense so of the accuracy of these yes. current imagery, yes. let's say we're outside, yeah. right? What level of detail can, can, can it make out the bottles on this table or just the fact that there's well, five people uh, sitting in a loop here? Like, how accurate yeah. are we talking well, about? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Commercial, commercial satellites. Yeah. Uh, currently, uh, we we can provide 50 centimeters uh, resolution imagery, yeah. which is roughly around this table, if every pixel, yeah. right? And we are launching new satellite, which goes down to 30 centimeters. Yeah. We got UAVs for emergency management that we are doing trial at the moment, we can provide up to 10 centimeters resolution, on-demand yeah. video streaming. These so, are commercial. So again, just to, because I'm not sure, maybe people in the room yeah. don't, the, that the numbers don't make so much sense, but okay. at, at 10 centimeter resolution, yeah. you can clearly make out that there are five bottles on that table, uh, right? Uh, almost, yeah. yes. Any, any object bigger than 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters can be Shows seen, up. Yep. right? But, but the, but look at agriculture, for example, or you, look, you want to look at your crops, you yep. have large area. You don't need half a meter. You don't need 10 yep. centimeters. One meter, two meter resolution is great. good. As long as you're looking at the homogeneous crop, for example, you look at wheat, you look at uh, different type of trees. What you can do, we, you can look into a measure leaf area index, how much greenness yep. your surface does have, what is the fractional cover, how much uh, soil versus vegetation is there, how much yep. chlorophyll content it does exist in your, in your land. Great. Then you run analysis, you know, uh, agronomist, um, uh, hydrologist use this data as a base data to, be make, to make a better sense out of it for individual area and farmers and so on. Great. And uh, for example, in Australia, uh, um, in, uh, um, we've been using uh, remote, remotely sensed data, they call it ET data, uh, evapotranspor evapotransportation yep. data, 
you look at the rainfall, look at the temperature, and you can, you can measure how much the water was used in that particular area. So, so, so that's, that's, my, that's kind of my core question. So if people in this room right, are interested in what's happening with water, how can we know that the people who are given the responsibility to use the water are using it responsibly? Is it, is it plausible to suggest that with satellites alone, we can get an accurate understanding of how much water is actually being used to grow a crop? Well, uh, in the industry, norm normally one solution cannot sort of rule out. I, I guess it's a combination of different technologies. Yep. For example, IOTs and sensors, right, right yep. has to come to the game as well as satellite-based data. For example, uh, there, is a, there is a project going on globally we are, uh, which provides a global high-speed Wi-Fi connectivity everywhere, yep. right? We are building 900 small satellites. When it's up and running within three years' time, most likely, yep. then all the IoT industry sensors for measuring water, measuring uh, soil moisture, measuring animals' health, and everything can be connected to the centralized area. Yep. I, then, then you can see where it goes. Okay, so I'm going to put some pressure on you now because no I'm, I'm going to ask for your over-under. <laughs> With just satellite, and I'll give you, let's say, let's say five years from now, yeah. how, without IoT, because I understand, obviously, if you've got sensors in the field as well, then that's great. But if you want this at really large scale, yeah. then starting with satellite seems like a, an interesting point. So if we're thinking about the five to 10 year time frame, what do you think is achievable in terms of accuracy of, of water utilization? Like, is it, could you get to 50%? Could you get to 90%? Give me your, if you had to place a bet, if you're okay. writing a big check with a... Okay, and uh, you, you're putting me on the spot in I this am. case. <laughs> it's not being recorded, it's okay. No, 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 that's okay, that's okay. Basically, uh, I just give you my interpretation yes. of this. It's not sort of... Your personal uh, opinions, that's my okay. My personal yes. opinion, I have to say this. Yes. And, um, yeah, I, I guess... Um, it, satellite based technology gives you a proxy, yep. not the absolute sure. measurement, we need to be aware of that. Yep. For example, if you have a stressed uh, crop, it shows that there is a lack of water in this particular area. Yeah, yeah. If you have a higher resolution imagery available, can, can, gives you, can give you the ability to measure that stress more accurately, yeah. therefore you will be better placed to measure those proxy in a better way. Yeah. In the future, we will have higher resolution imagery, yep. higher resolution data, which we can calibrate it. For example, that 10 centimeters data coming solar powered UAVs that yep. flies 20, uh, 65,000. You, you give me a lot of implementation detail here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna press you for the, because <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to zoom us out, right? If we're okay. looking at what's in the tool set, if we wanna make sure that at a planetary level, yes. we're managing water well, how much will we, will we be able to rely on satellites to give us that to give us that view. Well, I can tell you that 100% you need to rely on these. But yep. to me, um, you could potentially get up to 80%. Yeah, great. great. And uh, sometimes, is the hardest part is getting from 80 to 100% or 90 to 100%. Sure. Uh, but it gives you that ability. And I think is it also reasonable to distinguish between? And I totally get. It, I know this is where you're going. The sort of information that. Richard might use to make decisions on his farm yeah. versus the sort of information that Goulburn Murray Water or like a water authority might use to just sort of get a finger in the wind of they've grown way more yeah. than they should have been able to grow with the amount of water that our meter says that they got. Yeah. So yeah. do you think that second use case is, would you put it in the plausible camp or the <laughs> implausible <laughs> camp? Well, to me, uh, there are two things. Um, consistency is the key in any type of procedure and measurement. If you are incorrect always, up to 10%, yep. that's accurate enough to give you an indication of how you can improve your data. Cool. That's what's gonna happen, because you always get consistent result from the satellite data, then you can build on it to be able to make it more accurate. Great, all right, I, I'm gonna write down, so you said 90% accurate, cool. <laughs> So, so that's interesting, Don't put right? Me so, in trouble, then. <laughs> we're pushing into these innovation areas, right? So, we can see on one hand, we, we need to know as a society that these, 
these resources are being used responsibly. And on one hand, we want, it, we want water to go to productive use. We want vibrant economic areas. We want water to have a value, but we also have to make sure that it's an asset that's managed really carefully. And, and innovation has a, has a big role there. And Dan, I'm wondering if you can jump in here and what we haven't really touched on, you, you brought it up initially, the, the, you know, another very significant water user is all of the industrial processes that go into everything else that we consume. Um, you know, t tell us about the role of innovation there and, and the sort of pressures, both technological and probably, I guess, also from a corporate social responsibility yeah. that you feel uh, are driving innovation. Well, we, we see this quite vividly in our business because the input costs for our customers are just going up and up yeah. and up. And the reason for that is, uh, like, there's not one single reason, right? So, for instance, we might find that water is more expensive because of a lack of water in reservoirs in places in New South Wales. Water is more expensive in Brooklyn and Victoria because we built a fancy desalination plant. Water is more expensive on the Murray because of the chemicals that we put into the water, which have uh, phosphates in them and we can't dispose of them in a cheap way. So we, yeah. or the, the, the price of heating the water in an industrial plant through gas usually Got has it. gone through the roof as well, right? Okay. So yeah. we're, we're experiencing different rises in input costs and we have fixed contracts with a lot of our customers to run their facilities. So we have to absorb these, right? So I'm all for, I've got the financial incentive, it's yes. my company, to yep. push down the consumption of water. So yes, corporate social responsibility and children floating boats on little lakes and stuff is great, but I'm just going to go broke flat out if I don't reduce the amount of water we use yep. across Australia in food manufacturing plants. Yep. So there's a big motivation right there. And some of the things that Sounds we're doing, um, well, we're not just doing one thing, that's for, for sure. We're um, looking at different ways to reduce um, the amount of water that is required to do the individual processes. We've, um, there was a big move for clean in place and automatic cleaning of um, facilities. So they'd have these jets that would just spray on machines and then they'd be come and checked by uh, the hygiene operators. And those jets basically just use epically large amounts of water. So we just turn them off and we employ someone. So we can employ someone in say Swan Hill Abattoir to clean a, a belt um, and they can, it might take them 20 minutes where it might take an hour of automatic cleaning uh, spray jets to clean it and the, the differentiation in the cost sways us towards labour instead of water. Yeah, so that, I mean that's good for local um, employment and things like that. Yep. Um, we've also got uh, machinery, so we've taken it from, traditionally in food manufacturing plants there's been two types of water, it's usually hot water, but uh, hot and cold water, and then you have uh, five bar water, which is generally tap pressure water, or you have high pressure water, like your karcher, which you might spray your house with, uh, car with perhaps, not your house. Uh, we, we've developed a system of 20 bar water, which is water at, it's not high pressure, so it's not 90 bar, which is like your karcher water, and it's not five bar, which is your tap water, it's 20. And that gives us that sweet spot of enough pressure to clean down these plants without having to um, go to the higher pressure water and we get enough volume at that speed as well, yep. uh, at that pressure as well. So we get a really good sweet spot there. But beyond all of that, what we've done is tried to eliminate water completely. And uh, an example of that that we've used is our bacterial phages. Mm. So we employ viruses. They're great because I don't have to treat them well. They don't get public holidays, none of that. Um, that mostly uh, the bacterial phages that work with um, uh, salmonella and listeria. I have to say none of the plants that we work in have salmonella or listeria in them, obviously. Uh, but if they did, we would use these um, products. And these products basically are registered with Fizance, or Food Safety Australia New Zealand. They can be sprayed directly on food as a food processing aid, which means we don't have to list them on the food as, a, as an ingredient. And instead of washing down a whole plant, because we found a bacteria on a swab from a QA in the morning, we go through with a backpack with a little Makita battery on it, and we have a little spray bar just operated by one person, and they go down and spray all the food contact surfaces with this particular virus or phage, and that will eliminate the listeria, even if it's in a film or salmonella or E. coli, and that means that the amount of water we use goes down from somewhere below 100,000 litres to four litres. Yeah, wow, that's fascinating. And often, 
a, a, a food plant will get a hit of something like listeria. And if you get listeria hit in your food plant, it's like you've just been hit by lightning yeah. because it'll kill people flat dead. Yeah. So what they do is they, they say to us, hey, you're looking after our plant. Can you do an acid washdown? And what we do, we say, yeah, sure. We call up Ecolab, our chemical partners, and we dump 3,000 litres of toxic acid and about 100,000 litres of water down the drain yeah. to kill a microscopic bacteria. Now yeah. we're saying, well, how about we hit it up with some phage guard? That's great. And it's organic, it's kosher, and you can have it on your sandwich for lunch. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's a really good example of, of you know, what did you say? It was how many down to four? Four litres. Yeah, what was, the, what was the top figure? But over 100,000 yeah, litres. Yeah, that's yeah, and that's just at yeah. a small plant. Like a, a yeah. large plant, like a, a bottling plant or something like that, it can be many hundreds of thousands of litres just for one process. And that happens every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's incredible. And we're not talking about the type of water that you use either. We're talking about potable drinking yes, water that yeah, comes yeah. out of the tap. Right, so that's an yeah. interesting thing too, Because water isn't right? water, really. Yep. Which water Depends isn't water, is. and, and we have this sort of uh, perception to some degree that it is all the same. But I mean, a physically, it's in it's in very different locations, um, and 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 yes, also that you know some of it potable, a lot of it, a lot of it not. Um, so we talked a little, we've talked a bit about you know productive water and, and certainly industrial water and fascinating innovations there. There's a, there's a strong relationship between water and energy, and and. Um, Kristen, you, you were also mentioning in, in your kind of notes the, the role of water in the sort of overall renewables picture. Like, tell me more about ha, ha, the, the, the role that you see um, for, you know, for water in, in, you know, both managing, you know, energy use, but also just being part of our sustainability and, and uh, picture for people individually. Well, yeah, look, I guess the... The interesting thing about uh, zero mass water is that this idea that renewable technologies can be used for producing things other than electricity yeah. and that yep. the power of the sun can be harnessed for lots of different things and we're able to harness that energy from the sun to, to produce drinking water. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. And, the, um, and you, you also touched on there, so, the other thing that, that comes to my mind when we talk about the sun, obviously, is you know the uh, significant challenges we have as a country in, in terms of uh, climate variability, and, and large parts of the country are suffering, you know, possibly the worst drought that they've ever experienced. And you had some great little stories there that sort of touch at the intersection there. Yeah, well, look, I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about sustainable farming a lot over the next couple of days, but for us, that ties in strongly with the idea of sustainable communities, yep. full stop. Yep. So what we're seeing around the country is that in rural and remote locations, people don't have the same access to clean and consistent water that, that we get here in urban centres. So you touched on the fact that there's large scale investment in these solutions like desal plants and wastewater treatment. The, we get these solutions in urban centres, but the reality is that in a lot of regional areas, residents are still reliant on filtered rainwater or rainwater tanks. Uh, obvious issue there is that if it doesn't rain, you don't get water, and, and if it does, you still have to worry about keeping it clean and keeping it consistent. Otherwise, what people are doing, and we see this a lot, families are simply going to the local IGA buy up water. bulk water every that week. That was fascinating. And you, you, you told you know, a story there about how kids basically have to take their own bottled water to school because, yeah. Well, this is it. I mean, yeah. we see families at the end of the week with, you know, massive areas of, uh, of just plastic waste because they're going to have to, they have to go and buy their water. And what we're able to provide is this alternative that's, that's local. It's consistent, it's entirely off-grid, so you plonk one of these things on the ground or on the roof and it immediately produces clean drinking water without any need for power supply or water supply. Sounds like magic. It does sound like magic. We've had, just touching on what you, you mentioned, um, the, what we've been able to do in some of these communities, we've seen schools in drought regions in Australia where the kids 
either have to rely on mum and dad to, to buy them plastic bottled water to take into school each day, so the financial burden on the parents and the environmental burden obviously on the local community, or in some areas the kids are, are reliant solely on bore water, which, which mm. can be pretty salty and, and, and yucky by all accounts from the kids. So we had a very nice, um, nice situation, the three blue ducks in, in Byron Bay, the sort of the flagship for sustainable food production and, and service. They have our hydro panels on their roof and they're serving our water in a closed loop water supply up there in their restaurant. And for every carafe that's sold, they keep a little bit of surplus aside and they use that money to help out schools in drought regions. So they were able to donate panels to a school in Murrurundi in the Upper Hunter, yeah, great. a township that is struggling with the drought like many others. And in that school we've had great feedback from the principal who says now these kids who were, were either having to bring in their own plastic bottle or, or just not drinking at all during the day are now able to have fresh clean drinking water all day and... Great. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. That, that, that's, that's a great... I, I love that story. And, I mean, that's an extreme form, uh, if you like, of behavioural change because it's really it's enforced by, by very extreme conditions. And Dan, you touched on briefly the, the idea of like how much, how water intensive a lot of industries is. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your kind of thoughts about, you know, this concept of embedded water and just really understanding at the end consumption part, you know, how would I come to an opinion about how water intensive something is? Do we, is there anything happening there? Do, is there more we need to do to make sure that people can make well-informed decisions? Yeah, I think that's... That's something that there's a lot of people talking about. This is how much water is required to make your steak, for instance. Yeah, ap apparently a, a standard Australian dinner meal is six and a half thousand litres well, of water. That sounds like a lot, doesn't it? it does six sound and a half like thousand litres, <laughs> right. Yeah, so I think the way we visualise that is that how many bathtubs full is that? That type of thing. That's, right. that's the way we think about it, yes. right? How, yeah. how long does my tap run to make six and a half thousand litres of water? But if you've got a, an Angus piece of an Angus cow roaming around northern Queensland somewhere, consuming X amount of water over X amount of years of its life, it's probably not like the water that was in that yeah. field in the middle of nowhere was going to be like yep. in your bath or yep. in your tap. And the irrigation water that you use or that you pay for, um, you know, like obviously there's environmental uses for that water, yep. but there is also water that we can use for agriculture. And so do you think that's a risk? Yeah. That we risk simplifying it too far? Yeah, I think it really does. The water I use is literally the water that comes out of your tap, right? So I can talk about that. And we, even though I can talk about hundreds of thousands of litres of water that we use, we don't need, you don't even measure water in litres, right? No. Yeah. So it's like a whole order of magnitude sure. difference, right? So... I think we need to look at ways to, to um, reduce the water footprint on the, that mega scale of yep. like broad scale agriculture and uh, animal husbandry and all that sort of thing. But we yep. also need to do it on what's more of a micro scale, which is in the manufacturing sector. Yep. And um, I think we're doing that not because of corporate social responsibility, to be honest. Yep. We're doing that because of costs. And yep. I'll go over it again. It's the cost of the water it's the cost of pumping the water. Yep. It's the cost of heating the water. It's the cost of the chemical that goes into the water that you're mixing with it, because you're often mixing it with other chemicals. Yep. And then it's the cost of disposal of the water. And these large yeah. companies actually pay more than you do at your house to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the cost of the water is higher for them, even though they're much larger um, customers to the water boards and the cost of disposal is higher to them. So you've got a, a playing field that's really slanted. So 10 years ago, my company, bef before I owned it, um, would have been hit up with things like, oh, we're not getting enough production, we're not getting enough hygiene, the labour is too expensive. Now, if it gets through management, to me, it's usually you're using too much water, yeah. it's costing us too much. The input costs are killing us. Yeah. Uh, and that's only secondary to safety if there's ever a safety issue, cool. which obviously there's Great. not. Great, thank you. So we really need to acknowledge that the, 
we don't actually need legislation or like some sort of government program to do this because I'm the person who uses the water yep. and it's all the pressure is on me from my customers. It's, the, the market is actually working quite well. Yep. Um, what we probably need to do is look at ways to continually innovate so we can lower the, the cost of production so that we can have more access to export markets and things like that. Cool, thanks Dan. And, and Richard, is that, is that, uh, does that resonate with you in, in terms of production, crop, area, are, are market signals the way to go? Like do you believe that the open market that Australia has for water is largely working? I mean, I know it's, there's still a lot, a lot of problems. It's, uh, uh, yes, is the answer. Um, the, our key metric uh, in, that we measure our crop performance by is um, return per megalitre of water. Yep. And so that drives all our cropping decisions um, to the extent that this year we've halved our cropping um, program and anything we didn't have long-term offtake agreements for won't be grown simply because... just to really draw the point out, that's because the price of water has gone up so much. Price of water has made yep. uh, crops like cotton, um, fodder, um, unviable. In fact, a number of the crops we're growing is probably unviable as well, except we have commitments to customers that are long-term and strategic that we will we'll do that. So yep. it's um, everything we do is based on um, around water and, in fact, the country that we buy, um, we f first first criteria is that um, does it have good access to water, like infrastructure, and then uh, we, regardless of what it's, it's doing or currently growing, we look at whether it can be uh, suitable for transitioning to higher value crops. And that's, that's the thing that's going on in Australia now, and that's the thing that's driving the current water issues, apart from the lack of rain, is that there are some very high value crops such as almonds um, that you know they can afford to pay, you know, um, you know, five yep. ten thousand dollars a megalitre, where a a, um, a dairy farmer can only afford like, their break even is around the two hundred dollars a megalitre. So it's just to give people a sense of scale. So when you you quoted five thousand dollars a meg, that's for a temporary allocation of water. Uh, sorry, I should clarify. So um, let's say. Five, Yes, they say 5,000 temporary allocation. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and that's up from a low of... Well, it was free. It let's, was let's free. Let's put it in, in recent scale. Well, put Recently it back five years ago, we were paying $130 a megalitre. Right. Yep. And, um, and you know, where we are now, we're paying... It'll, it'll hit 1,000 probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fascinating. Uh, Webster's Sorry. We manage Webster's Walnuts, which is kind of near where you're operating, or a bit further north. And they can afford, like, like the almonds, they can afford to pay huge amounts for their water, but you just don't have that profit margin in wheat or yeah. sorghum or something like that. Yeah, yeah great. Um, conscious that I want to leave plenty of time uh, for, for audience questions, so um, maybe we'll flick over. Cal, how are we doing there? Oh, hello. Yeah, sure. So um, I'll, I'll probably... Um, throw the first question through, but um, for everybody who is on the Global Table app, if you just click onto this session, uh, you can go in and you can ask a question. It'll come through to me and I'll be uh, do my best to, uh, to moderate it and uh, send it up to the panel. So we've got about, about 15 minutes yeah. left for questions, so please send your questions through and uh, we'll get them through to the panel. Um, so the first one's really around uh, technology, and so probably more around the solution space to some of the challenges that we've discussed today, and yep. maybe uh, maybe directed more towards uh, uh, so Richard yeah. and Dan. Yep. Um, yeah, love to hear about um, the technologies or the solutions that are on the horizon in both of your businesses that uh, are really going to completely sh you know shift the needle and be a game changer. Uh, I'll just say quickly, we we are big users of technology um, for all the reasons we've spoken about. Um, in terms of efficient water use and, and like I said we've invested heavily in, in technology to do that and it's, it's driven and that's made possible by uh, technology availability that you know companies like yours are providing so I'll hand over to you. Uh, well it's something just I just add to, the, to this particular one I mean possibly you all heard about digitalization, digital transformation and so on. And then every industry is moving into having their data and system in a, in a digital environment. Smart farms, smart 
Actic, smart buildings, smart cities, and so on. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, considering the availability of the data and in a digital format, which is well connected, uh, it's going to change the whole industry in the near future because you will have sensors that can transfer data and it can be digitally connected to the other type of data and it can make it available in your iPhone or send an SMS message to you and so on. I think the key is around connectivity and having access, quick access to data from technology from what I can see. Okay. I'll uh, just take an indulgence and step just tangentially away from water for a second to tell you something that's actually been commercially kept under wraps until now and I thought I'd share it now. Um, the technology I spoke about before, the viruses that attack bacteria, we've been developing them for various foodborne bacteria and um, we've actually had a real estate play inside my business for land across Victoria because there's about, depending on who you ask, about three to seven percent of Victoria that's not usable for agriculture because it's covered in a particular type of bacteria. That bacteria was imported from India some time, a long time ago, and that bacteria is anthrax. And our phage technology is at the point where we're testing it against anthrax spore capsules. And we think we're going to be able to get there within about three to eight months. Once we've done that, we'll be able to crop dust three to seven percent of Victoria with anthrax phage and eliminate anthrax from the environment, returning that land to agricultural production. So we've been buying up land that's worth nothing because it's covered in anthrax and uh, we look to be able to return that to agricultural production, if not sell it on to someone else who might return it to agricultural production. <laughs> and um, that's an example of a technology, whilst it does have water implications because those, um, that, that land will then be in the market for purchasing water on the open market. There is also water resources that are available on that land that have been locked up because the, the, the water um, isn't usable for agriculture because it can carry anthrax. So there'll be about three to seven percent of water in Victoria that falls on Victorian farmland will become accessible if this project works out. So we're working with the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands and Cambridge in the United States. And uh, once we have this technology, we've licensed it for Australia and China and um, we'll be releasing it in the Australian market. So cool. that's probably the most cutting edge innovation in terms of technology that we've yeah, got going. Fascinating, and, and, and there's, there's plenty in the, in the biotechnology chest, I think, yeah. that, that are, big, are big answers here. I, I've got one answer, if, I, if I'm allowed to, which is I think part of the innovation is, is business model innovation, um, and which is marrying different ways of solving the problems, and I really do want to give a shout out um, to Richard, to Wedgetail, to Kilter, and to Vic Super, who are absolutely uh, pushing the envelope as far as sustainable, water efficient production, ring up your super fund and tell them that you want them to put your money into efficient, sustainable agriculture in Australia. Great, thank you. So the next one's really around uh, how do we get the balance right uh, between water use for agriculture um, as well as water, water for the environment? Um, that's probably a rigid question. It is. Sure. It is. sure. So we, we um, on, the, on this project in um, uh, Lake Boga, we have ten, operated about 10,000 hectares, of which 50% is intensive um, irrigation. The other half is what we categorise as environmental management, uh, which was a fundamental part of this entire project. And so um, we, we employ hydrologists and, um, and a number of uh, experts in the in sort of land management field, but with the purpose being is to look at how uh, that, that land can sustain um, the, the type the, the intensive agriculture whilst um, improving the landscape. So we, we sort of came back to this project in a, a opposite way to a lot of investors would where the business model we set up was to facilitate investment in environment, in, in environment and improvement in, in land use. So um, the work that I do in selling crops is to really attract, make uh, investment in, you know, in land attractive enough that we can then use part of that to improve um, usage. So we've developed a, um, actually, uh, what we call it environmental condition reporting, which is, forms part of our budgeting process which uh, looks at basically baselining, um, setting a baseline for environmental condition on water, soil, 
um, and uh, vegetation and, also, and potentially other things could be included in that, such as bird life. But, and, then, and then we report on that and um, have established, we've been working with um, uh, the Wentworth Group of Concerned Scientists and Soils for Life to help establish a, a model which would allow us to, to uh, put a, a value on it, which we see is absolutely fundamental in um, being able to put ultimately the next step in putting a price on the environment. So uh, if you can't measure it, you can't, you can't pay for it, is our view. Yeah. Awesome. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question um, is probably for Kristen, um, and it's about um, the, the cost per megalitre for, for water using your, your technology, um, and if it will ever reach competitive uh, levels for agriculture in Australia. Thanks for that. So our technology is primarily for drinking water, so we're not at the stage where we're able to produce volumes for irrigation. Obviously, we hope to be at some point. We offer our panels under two different models. There's a CapEx model under which you buy a panel for 3,000 Australian dollars. It produces 300 litres per month. And over the lifetime of the panel, you're looking at about 18 cents per litre uh, from, from that panel purchase. But moving away from that, we also have the OPEX model, which allows us to actually establish large-scale water farms, so more like 200, 1,000, 2,000 panels. And we sell the water produced from that water farm on a per litre basis. So that's a service model that we can provide for communities, uh, hospitality venues, areas that need more of a large-scale solution for their water use. Uh, and those water purchase contracts are at about 30 cents per litre over 5, 10, 15 year terms. Great, thank you. Um, next question is about um, the, um, probably for Syed, um, about your uh, how your technology is going to help the 450 million smallholder farmers around the world? Uh, well, uh, this, this, uh, what we can offer right now for the technology that we have developed is very much can help every individual farmers if they want to, if they got the technology, they can monitor their farm uh, in a very small scale. It could be 10 hectares, or it could be 100 hectares, or it could be 10,000 hectares. That's the key differences. In old days, you had to get all the images to be able to process it and make it available. But now what you do is, if all of these images, let's say five years, three years, 10 years, depends what type of satellite data it is in the storage, you, you select small portion, and on demand, it does the analysis for you and provide the data to you and then you get a graph. You see, you lo you've been looking at the greenness, for example, of your farm two years ago, every two months, depending what you got available. You click on it, you can see the value, velocity of the number as it goes forward and so on. Therefore, uh, it just comes back to how individual farmers, uh, they can utilize the data normally we provide this data as a base layer to SMEs, to the consultant, to agronomists, uh, to the hydrologists, to the people who can actually add more value added to our base data to interpret it and customize it for that particular region. Always local, info local information is the key when it comes to this. But the reality is, yes, uh, in any small scale, you can have access to the data. Can I just say that the, the companies that I work with, they look at large scale data like your data sets to uh, decide whether they're going to put on another production line or their forward purchasing and things like this. So even though the small scale farmers might not individually be looking at the data, yeah. their That's customers nice. might be. And if their customers see, look, this is going to be a good season or we're heading in the yeah. right direction, then Absolutely. it can have a, have a really big effect on the individual small scale farmer, yeah. even right down to the micro level. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, I mean, a, a related sort of subject there, I think what we have come out of a time when, especially in agriculture, people have kind of regarded what they've done on their farm as even proprietary, but, but proprietary in the sense that it's private, but also potentially proprietary because they're doing things that they don't want people to know. But uh, 
we're not very far away from a time when anything that's conducted outdoors is apparent to anybody who's, who's got the budget to acquire the imagery. And, and that's yeah, going to completely change the kind of social license for, for agriculture. Sure, thanks. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Yep. Um, yeah, so I guess this is really around um, how do we see uh, into the future as, uh, as, as climate change um, becomes more of an influencing factor on our agriculture systems and particularly on our uh, water availability um, and how we see that driving uh, crop selection in, in various regions around the world and uh, how we see that changing. I'll just start. I'm sure everyone's got a, got a comment. I think climate change is really where it's at in terms of that language. We need to understand that the climate is changing and that's not going to just mean that everything's burnt to a pretzel. It means that there's more heat, there's more evaporation, we're going to lose water off the land, we're going to have more storms, there's going to be different weather patterns and we're going to have different areas of Australia, I can't speak globally, but we're going to have different areas of Australia that behave differently and if you, if you look at the climate models that are put forward, that's, that's, that's what we need to be looking at. We need to be looking at forward forecasting. Does that mean that the tropics are going to move south? Maybe, I don't know. Does it mean that different types of agriculture are going to be need to be performed in different areas of Australia? I think that's what we need to do. We can't just say climate change, this is what it's going to mean for Australia. We need to go down to the regional level and say, what does this mean for this part of Australia? And that means, do we build a production facility there? Do we invest in agriculture there? And do we put infrastructure there? Because we, we don't have an unlimited capacity for this. So we need to look at where the climate is changing on an individual regional basis, and then tailor our approach to that as, as companies and as governments. So that's, that's what I was thinking anyway. Richard? Uh, I just add a couple of comments to this. You're absolutely right. I guess uh, one thing which we, we need to be aware of, okay, of climate change is not a myth, it's happening. That's the first thing. Second is now we have global data set which we can monitor global every day, every few weeks. Data coming all the time and the scientists, they are monitoring the whole global changes and so on. Uh, looking at the overall results and how it gets measured and also looking at the local I think these, the trends need to be measured, and they can. I mean, is, you know, all the measure, all the statistic you see they, they provided to you is based on the real data. It's just a matter of how much you want to believe it, and that's the that's the differences between politician and the scientist, I guess. Uh, we, I think, we are the southernmost cotton grower in the world, um, growing in a region which, you know. 10 years ago, no one would have ever thought you'd grow cotton. And, and that's, that's the, really the reality of it. And we're currently doing trials on growing mangoes in, um, in um, Swan Hill. So, they, I mean, they're new varieties, but they're also, it's, it's due to climate change, these things. So um, we are very cognizant of that. And all our planning is around um, dealing with uh, water events, being able to get water off country as water comes down in torrents uh, so as to save crops um, so it's it's critical yeah cool. Kristen? yeah I mean I, I, I think you're right like, like it's, it's the, the big scale changes we can't do much about I, I, I think as an industry and certainly as an investor what we really think is necessary is to engage you know consumers in a more informed conversation about what sustainably produced crops really are um, you know, I, I, I think the pressure that animal agriculture at the moment is under is a good example of what happens when you simplify discussions too far and, and you know, there's some risk around water management and what's happening in the media's treatment of water management in Australia that, that it erodes social licence for agriculture. Uh, and, you know, we, we've got to engage in a more informed... And you, you have to develop, you know, a higher kind of sense of discerning nature around the products that you want and send stronger signals about where you want your super invested and where you invest your consumer dollars. Yeah, and I think that comes at a cost as well. Totally. If we, we can't have our cake and eat totally. it too. So totally. if we want environmental outcomes, we want high quality produce and we want good returns on our super, well, we can sort of have all of those, but they're all gonna have to live in an ecosystem together, Yep. right? And so, um, 
you know, like I get asked for 15 different things a day and sometimes I can't deliver them all to my customers because, yeah, and one of the, one of the clear examples, you said water getting off your, the property, we're actually, a lot of the climate change models predict a lot of rain, it's just in uh, like severe circumstances. So yeah. maybe that means we need to manage water in our landscape better. And like no one wants to put a dam in their backyard, sure. but storing water, if it's gonna become irrationally dumped on our land, seems like a pretty good idea to me. And you know, do we want agriculture? Do we want to have yeah. access to this water? Uh, it's, um, they're, they're, they're discussions that we might have been able to avoid, but I think they're the discussions for our time. Totally, totally agree. We do want agriculture. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, appreciate uh, the time you've given us today to hear the conversation. Hopefully, it was worth your investment.